Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Concora Corner. I'm your host, Graham Waldrop, and today we're talking with Dale Cruz, who's the greater area sales manager out in Washington State for Allura, who sells fiber cement for remodeling and building homes. Dale also goes into great detail about his sales process and how he builds a core foundation of what it takes to be successful, and he disseminates that to his crew, but how he's also able to take into account everybody's personality, their work schedules, and their tendencies, and is able to mold and bend that process into a cohesive whole that allows everybody to be successful. We try to do the same thing at Concord on the product side in the sense that we have a core foundation of rules and practices that we need to adhere to, But we also have a wide variety of folks who wear a lot of different hats and are responsible for a lot of different things and have different work styles. So it's the great challenge of how you build this core foundation of how things should be run, but also be able to take into account the strengths and weaknesses of your team. How can you bend your rules a little bit so that everybody benefits from that and you're still performing at a high level and everybody is as happy as they can be? It's a hell of a challenge, and Dale goes through it in depth here in terms of how he's able to execute it to perfection out in Washington State. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. But first, a quick word from Kip. I wanted to thank everyone again for listening to our podcast. And if you're interested in knowing more about Concora, we help building product manufacturers get specified and purchase more by providing a great web experience that's bolted onto your website makes it easy for your architects, engineers, and contractors to do business online with you. Uh, We sum it up as three things. It's providing a good web experience, good content, and good tools. And we have some great tools such as submittals, sustainability, project showcases, or anything else needed by your design community to specify and purchase products. We'd be more than happy to show you a quick demo, and you can go to concora.com, C-O-N, C-O-R-A.com to learn more, read case studies, and see how other customers have grown sales with our partnership. Uh, yeah, so hey, hey, Dale, thanks for joining our Concord podcast. Really appreciate the time. And I know, you know, when we were talking a few weeks ago, it was just really impressive just learning about your products and your fiber cement siding and uh, really uh, look forward to showing and, and what our uh, listeners can learn about your experience and your, your wealth of knowledge. And uh, would love to hear who you are, Dale, and what your company does and what makes uh, your products great versus other folks. I'm the uh, area sales manager for Pacific Northwest for Allura Fiber Cement. And I coach my team how to sell my products uh, most effectively and I'm also uh, in the field doing sales so I'm uh, kind of a dual purpose guy in that respect yeah so you're like a player coach and that's awesome I I know definitely I I respect a lot of folks that can one only just build great teams and be a great leader but can also be there to help mentor and and coach it's it's definitely a i'd say a dying art nowadays where you can really show by example and it sounds like that's what you're doing yeah i'm it's definitely what i do um you know i the player coach i mean there's a reason why there aren't a lot of player coaches in the nfl right because uh it's hard to coach from the field you can't see everything that's going on yeah um so i will uh, I fully admit that I spend way more um, time ad- doing administration part of my job, which is frustrating because I've been a field guy, you know, most of my life. So, or, you know, whatever, most of my career, I guess I'll say. So it's, uh, it's been a, it's been a, a learning process for me going into sales management from uh, being a, you know, field sales guy. Yeah. But well, yeah. I, I love it. That's interesting. So I, as you mentioned, if you're a um, leading the team and there's a certain amount of overhead, like uh, administration and reporting and executive meetings, uh, what's what's the challenge that you've seen? Is it, it just is it really about uh, time management or is it about how can you coach effectively when you're not there all the time or not in the field? But can you share any of that? 
Yeah. Most of, I mean, if, if there's one, the administrative time, I'm, it just takes more administration time, I think. So it's just not being out in the field in, you know, my smaller area that I just cover for myself, Mm -hmm. but I have to be able to still react to the needs of my team in a timely manner. That's the whole thing. So I guess, yeah, it is, it is time management, but it's also knowing uh, communication wise, how to communicate to your, your team. Hey, I'm going to be busy during these times. So we have connected calendar that we use that is uh, it's a great tool, I think. And it's nothing, I think it's just outlook. Um, you'll find as we go through this, that I am not the best uh, computer guy out there, <laughs> but uh, so, so there's um, there's a lot of tools that are available, at least that I've been able to find and use to, help my team know that they'll get an answer after I'm done with a meeting. Cause that's just kind of the rules. I set the expectations early on how uh, my management style is, which is really not uh, micromanaging. I, I want my people to be successful. They come to me with questions for sure. But if anybody's been in the, in a sales job and it, I've, I've sold a lot of different things over the years, um, And I can just tell you that the sales process is really similar for most products. So for me, it's just a matter of guys, here's the process that we're going to use. Um, especially if I, I, like I just hired a new person in, in one of my areas and, uh, it's just going through, here's the process, you know, let's work on this together. And then being able to track those steps, uh, to coach them up or mentor them, um, into how to be uh, successful with the products that we have to sell. Dale, do you think that evolved from your own time when you were more so just strictly in the field in terms of wanting to give uh, your folks sort of some leeway there in terms of getting used to the process and executing the process? Absolutely. And and I have um, a unique skill set. I've got... um, I, I know that uh, my team is probably, if they ever hear this, are going to cringe when I say that, you know, I may, I have a bunch of kids, right? And not that my, you know, I don't treat my team as kids, but having um, seven kids, you learn about different personalities and how to manage that personality to be their best self, right? Their best whatever, if they're going to be the best wrestler or the best um, cross country runner, the best computer program or whatever it is, you know, I might not understand like my youngest son is a computer programmer. I have no idea what he's doing. Um, it makes me nervous every time he gets around one of my computers and there's a screen that I've never seen before. So I have no idea what he's doing, but I know that he is excellent at what he does. Right. And so it's, we've just followed a process. Look, if you want to go this direction, then you're going to, you want to go into computer programming, then you don't, um, in school, you take classes that are going to get you to your goal. Right. And so in sales, we all have, uh, we used to call them quotas. They're not called quotas anymore. They're called, uh, budgets now. Right. Cause that's a nicer word, but, um, here's your budget that you need to hit, whether it's for, um, average selling price, ASP or, um, or volume or margin, whatever it is. Hey, here's our goal. This is the way that I think that we can, this is the best way I think we can get there. How does that, how does, um, how are we going to use our sales process to get to those goals? A more succinct way to answer your question is absolutely my field experience and dealing with different styles of people managing me to take those lessons and say, okay, this really frustrated me when this was happening with my manager you know, in the past. So how can I make sure that I don't frustrate my team to, so that they're, you know, unhappy, right? Because happy sales guys sell more is my typical experience. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So what, what does that structure actually look like in terms of, of how you've set up your team, uh, day-to-day responsibilities, things like that, in terms of, of trying to, to build something that is successful? Well, I try and I really for, Um, where I live, it's by it's geography, right? Uh, In the West, um, 
Where are you guys, by the way? Sorry that I don't know this already. We're in Atlanta. Yeah, both of us. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, there's some major differences between the way that um, the East Coast is and West Coast. It's here just because of population density. Okay. You guys, I'm, my kids live in Atlanta or one of my kids lives in Atlanta. And uh, I mean, you guys, there's people everywhere over there. Uh, it's, it's crazy to me how many people are over there. I know that there's areas you can get out away from the Atlanta area. And, you know, there's areas where you have a little more space and there's not as many people, but in the West, um, especially Washington, Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, you might have a four hour drive between stops, you know, between the actual customers that you could call on or, you know, builders or, or dealers or distrib distribution, whatever it is. So that's how I try and I try and manage a guy's territory by taking a look at the geography. And it helps of course, because I've been in this area so long, I kind of understand, um, a four hour drive in uh, Seattle or Portland, for example, or a, a, a 20 minute drive in Portland or Seattle, sorry, 20 mile drive in Portland, Seattle might take you uh, an hour. Whereas a 20 mile drive in um, Bozeman or Billings, unless you hit the time off is going to take you 15 minutes. Right. But to get from, Billings to Bozeman or Bozeman to Bill, you know, wherever it's going to take you an hour and a half. So I try and set my territory up just based a lot on geography. I've got, I split Seattle into a couple different markets. Uh, Portland is a different market than the rest of Oregon. And, um, you know, and then you have Eastern Washington. I, that's just how, that's how I do it. I try and make it so that doesn't necessarily have to be equitable because you can play with the, the, uh, the numbers a little bit as far as quota or not quotas, uh, budgets um, to match the market. Right. But it's, it's hard if you set a, a, um, a KPI, for example, of, Hey, you have to make uh, seven calls a day and enter them into Salesforce. Well, that guy in Seattle, there's, it's not going to happen. He's going to have a really effective day. He's going to be able to land, you know, five maybe appointments in a day. You know, it's just different. Whereas the guy in, in uh, Billings, he can make eight calls in, in eight hours pretty much and not break a sweat. So it's one of those things where you got to look at the quality of the calls that they're going to make. Um, you know, there's going to be certain types of customers that are, um, that are going to take longer time. It's if you've got a, a custom builder, for example, you're going to spend more time with that guy because he's going to buy higher ASP products, um, average selling price products, higher price products. And he's going to, he's going to build fewer homes. So, you know, you're going to spend the time up front with him and then he's only going to call you when, when he needs you. Yes. You're going to follow up, but typically those follow-ups can be, once a quarter with that guy and he's going to be happy. Um, in Seattle, it might just take longer. It might, it's just different. Yeah, no, it makes sense, uh, Dill. And, and I really appreciated your comment on managing or adapting your management style based on the personalities and people that you have and, 10 kids is a phenomenon. <laughs> yeah. One that has it's 10, only seven. It's oh, only seven. seven but seven yeah. Kids. yeah. So you're going to planning to have more kids there. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. No, um, I've got grandkids. now. So I'm doing good. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and then the, the, uh, you said something about a sales methodology. You know, I, I was just curious on both of those things. Like, uh, so you're matching up a, a good sales methodology, which I, I'm sure is a bit, foundational to whoever is on your team but then how you make a person successful to their budget will be based on their personality what they're good at what you need to coach on and then your management style so could you go over that a little more and maybe you know what's an example of a a style management style because you mentioned you you run into seven of them or five of them yourself 
And yeah, yeah. Any, any good examples there from, from your team? And then on the sales methodology, what, what in general is your sales methodology? Well, mine is somewhere between uh, control freak, and <laughs> I don't know the exact term of that, and complete laissez-faire, right? Yeah. So hands off, or it's somewhere in the middle of those. And once again, it really depends on the guy that you're that you're managing or, or girl, lady, uh, woman <laughs> that you're managing yeah. because, um, you'll get a guy that is really, I've, I've, I've got this, had this experience very recently where you've got, um, a person that is super high excitement, but they are really suck at paperwork. I mean, like to the point where they let things drop through the cracks that, are actually important steps of the process. So it's one of those things I like my, I'm not going to say my sales process because I have learned it. And, um, over the last 20 years, I've learned the sales, a sales process just through reading books. I'm my sales process isn't anything, uh, new in, in, in my opinion, it's just, tips and tricks that I've picked up that work for my personality, me and my personality. And then I leave it generalized enough to where that sales process can work with any personality. So, and I just, uh, if you, I, I believe in, and that's the best way I can put it. I really believe in having a sales process from soup to nuts all the way through so that if there's ever a question of, Hey, how do I, you know, I'm at this step and I can't get past this step and you can say, Oh, and you can coach or mentor that uh, person to get through that based on their personality. They, they will find a way. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're the lowest energy type person in the world. I find that lowest energy people are great on other aspects of the sales process, right? You have to, you know, when I was a contractor, I didn't, um, I didn't try and, uh, screw, um, fasteners in with a hammer. You know, I mean, it's, you got to use your tools where they're best, but what they're for, what they're best adapted to. And if you've got somebody that doesn't have, you know, there's no, uh, real hunter, you know, cause in my opinion, you've got hunters and you've got gathers and then you got people that are kind of in the middle as far as salespeople go. And if you've got someone that isn't a real hunter, but they're good at the other stuff, the, the paperwork part setting appointments and they're just, you know, like a plow horse and they just keep going and, you know, they're not, uh, they don't hit those peaks and valleys as much as the people, those high energy, you know, hunter type people hit, but they have a constant steady increase. You can man. I, I find it. Um, those are probably the simplest people to manage in my opinion, because they'll follow the process. The hunter gatherer types or the hunter types are, um, high energy, um, high emotion, which can sometimes be draining. Thanks. Thank goodness. I've got a, a mixture of those types of personalities with my kids. Right. So, um, when a problem arises, they're run around like their hair's on fire, but really it's just, they haven't gotten out their sales process because they forgot that they had it. Right. And they, Oh yeah, that's right. I, I got to read that again. And that's okay too. You can manage to, to that, um, selling style, right. Or that personality. It's just, Hey, look, what's it say, you know, what's step three or whatever, what's part C of step one, the sales process that I use, you, you could literally use it for sales of, I could uh, be selling fiber cement, roofing, any, any building product. I know that this sales process works because I've been doing this for long enough to know. And I, this, I use the same sales process when I was um, selling jobs as a contractor. That's just, it's really a, it's really a very simple and easy thing to do. It's about 37 pages long. It seemed like when I was writing it out, but it's really not that, that long. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And I, and I, I appreciate what you're saying with, um, you have a person's talents. Some people are 
very excited and outgoing and others are very good at the paperwork. Um, but do you find it that at some point you may have people that are just not fits? So how do you gauge whether a person has enough talent and experience to be successful? Is it according to the budget? Is it according to the overall progression? Are they coachable? But what's your kind of way to measure that deal? If I'm looking for a new salesperson, I'm looking for, um, I really am looking for more of a personality. You know, if I need somebody that's going to be good at architectural specs, I know that I'm going to be looking for someone that's organized, really organized and uh, presents themselves well, that doesn't talk like a roofer, like yours truly, um, and that can, uh, that can learn the technical details of whatever pro, you know, of fiber cement, because that's what I'm selling right now. So it's one of those things I can, I can teach, uh, anybody the technical stuff, but having the, I don't know, soft skills is a, a term I've heard bandied about recently. And if I, if I can pull those soft skills out during an interview and I do not have a process, uh, set up but just so you know a set process for an interview i have some general questions that i that i go through with every uh prospective uh person that i'm looking at to put on my team it's really going to be based on that person's personality because you can't see that in a uh phone call or uh an inter or a resume that's been emailed to you right that's one of the things that i mean from what i'm getting from hearing you talk about your process is that it's, it's uh, pretty methodical in the sense that you have a, a very clear blueprint and uh, on how things fit, but you, you can also be very balanced in terms of being able to get different types of personalities, but still have the core of the process. The foundation is there, which I think is, uh, which is really great, which is something that on, on my end, on, on the product side, we kind of try to do a similar thing where we have uh, a lot of folks who we work a lot with the develop, development team, and, you know, we have a lot of different personalities in there and it's sort of like, okay, we have a structure of how we're supposed to do things, but how can we also, you know, make sure it's not a square peg round hole thing where we can kind of cater to the tendencies of people, but we're still getting results. And I think that's important to be flexible there. So I'm definitely relating a lot to what you're saying there. I, when I'm interviewing and it's funny because we had a, a regional meeting this morning and one of the, one of the, my team members popped up that, Hey, when, when Dale hired me, he told me what, uh, what I should expect. I'm a big believer in managing expectations of any situation, right? I don't care if it's with, uh, my kids, you know, my personal relationships, my buddies, whatever to, um, you know, my, the, the builders that I call on the dealers that I call on my employee, you know, my team, the guys that work with me, even my, even my bosses, I, I like to manage expectations and, um, where I can, I like to under promise and over deliver. Right. I mean, that just makes you look like Superman every time you actually pull it off. So that's one thing I think that during the interview process that you can, um, so you're not setting someone up for failure, right? Number one, you'll have somebody that's, you'll have an idea of a gap or a hole that you have in your team and something that you want to fill. And then you can interview to that, um, objective, right? That's your objective to find a, a solution for this segment. It's always best to manage those expectations from your team or to your team, or to just tell them what to expect when you, when they come to work at your, at your place. I mean, interviewing is still just another sales job, right? I want you to come work for me. So I'm going to, explain to you um, how awesome it is to work for me. Yeah, different form of sales. It's kind of like the value prop of a, of a website in a way where it's sort of like you're getting, you know, you should know right when you're coming into an interview, when someone's explained to you, you know, what the job is, you know, laying out that core value of what we're trying to do. Because if that's left murky, you know, things can definitely get off on the wrong foot there. Right. Well, and then it leaves too much open for interpretation. I, I mean, you, I hate, well, you said blah, blah, you know, whatever it is, because it's one of those things like, no, when I, when I 
when we were talking about this, what I said was, you know, whatever. And, but there, what they heard was, was different. So to be clear in your expectations and to manage that, I think is, is critical in, in every aspect of sales, to be honest with you, it's the, the best, it's the best salesman tool. Um, one of the best salesman tools available that and good time management skills, I think are, are two huge components to any sales process. How does that method translate to working with other folks in other departments, like working with product or working with marketing? Does that translate directly in terms of the expectation piece or is, or is it get a little murkier there when you're uh, doing more work internally outside of, outside of sales? Well, I mean, you know, we can talk sales versus marketing all day long. Right. I mean, the, uh, the thing with managing to, or, you know, with other departments, because obviously, you know, they have a, a totally different chain of command that, that I have typically. So, uh, managing those types of expectations is, uh, I, I just like to be very, very clear and succinct with what my expectations are. Um, and even if I have to repeat it multiple times, cause that, that happens, right. I mean, it just does if, and if the, hopefully the, the person that you're negotiating with, cause really it's just another part of the sales of the sales job. Right. So you're, you're selling, uh, marketing. I'm just going to use marketing. You're going to sell marketing on your need. What I need for this area is this piece of whatever, a flyer or a, you know, a, some sort of marketing piece. And they're asking questions about it. And when, you know, it comes down to after you got the, the expectation of what the piece should look like, then you have the expectation of delivery, right? When is this going to be delivered? And even if I have to ask 10 times in that meeting um, for an expected date on when I'll have that piece of uh, marketing material, uh, I'll get one. Even if I don't care if it's, you know, six months away and I need it tomorrow, at least I have a date that we can start from. Right. So, so then from, from there, it's just, for me, it's a communication thing, which my wife would alert, would laugh on the floor or roll on the floor laughing. If she heard me talking about communication, by the way, but uh, communicate the need, get the date. And then I follow up with an email summarizing that meeting. And I, once again, I use that process with, uh, with a dealer, distributor, my team mates, my, my uh, direct report, whatever, because it, there's, it just leaves less ambiguity in, in life. So, and it, by the way, this is making me sound like I'm very organized. I'm not the most organized guy, but in order to make sure for me, I set tasks for everything. And so it's one of those things where, you know, as I'm going through and training on my sales process or the sales process that I want my team to use, I should say, um, it's one of those things where I'll go, Oh yeah, that's something I need to work on. I've always, there's always room for improvement, um, in, in myself. Right. And I, so that hopefully will keep me humble, even though my team would probably roll on the floor laughing if they hear this when I said that I was humble. So, well, Dale, I, uh, I disagree with your wife. I think you're a great communicator. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Know. I'll let her know. <laughs> I actually, I'm, Make sure that that makes it into the makes it into this, so that I can uh, just repeat it. I'll just put that one sentence on repeat over and over on a loop. Well, we'll mail it to your wife, and then uh, we'll, yeah, there we'll you go. go, there you go. Um, but no, I appreciate that. I you know I I hear when you're talking about getting setting expectations, and uh, and I my background some of it's in project management, and it's certainly a a technique, right? Where you're trying to negotiate and have some type of relationship in a meeting like marketing and, and you're looking for a partnership where you need them to help you and uh, they need your help and 
and vice versa. So, uh, and, and that technique of being able to one listen, right. And, and, and then give expectations and, and a reason why you need something like in your case, that, that marketing, uh, uh, slick or that, that type of flyer that you mentioned, and then just asking, right. And, and I, I run into a lot of salespeople that don't follow that. And I really do appreciate that summary too, because that's just, it gives you a, uh, a voice to tell the story that everyone remembered and probably forgot. Right. And gives you then that voice to uh, set expectations after the meeting and the next steps to, uh, cause either they forgot, they don't remember, or uh, it, there might've been other things in there. And so that, that's definitely something I appreciate and for what you're doing there. Um, and I, I know uh, part of what we're talking about deal is to kind of go over more of what you do as a product at Allura and with your fiber cement sidings. And, and a lot of our listeners have this challenge too, where, uh, you know, they're, they're not necessarily in a, in a category where it's all about quality or elegance. And it's about sometimes we, we talked to a lot of people uh, deal with says, Oh yeah, they just look at the price, right? They look at the price and how do you uh, overcome that with your product? You know, not being like the number one in your space and, is it relationship? Is it a technique? Is it about differentiating a product? So could you walk us through a little about that? The way that, uh, that I go about it, because I've been in the building products industry or space, either working with them or, um, or selling them for a long time, I've got, I do have relationships and they're, a, they're a great place to start. Right. So it doesn't matter really where the relationships come from. I've got a lot of professional re relationships in this, in my work, and I've developed a fairly good reputation as, um, which is by the way, in sales is pretty easy to do. All you have to do is pick up your phone and answer emails from your customers and, and you'll be about 10 steps ahead of most of the competition. You develop those relationships and that's, those are good ways to get the door open when you switch products or you've got a product that isn't necessarily the market leader in the segment that you're in. Um, but after that, you kind of have to find something to differentiate yourself. Um, if, if you're not the market leader, you know, your company, how do they go to market? Are they the cheapest guy out there? You know, hopefully not. I, I really don't like, selling on price. That's never been my, my shtick. Uh, but there's a lot of people to do and selling on prices is, is a way to go to market. There's no question about it. There's a lot of people that a lot of companies that do that and that's what their plan is and good for them. They should go and work that plan and make that and be successful at it. I think that's great. Uh, the way I like to do it is to find a differentiator or some different differentiator with either the company uh, can be the warranty can be the the company can be the um the service level is where i like to land because you know there's there is a huge value add to good service um and maybe it's just the fact that you pick up your phone when you, when you get a phone call right it could be lots of different things as far as a service level. And hopefully you've got something uh, that's different about your product than, than the other guy that you can capitalize on in order to um, generate interest in your product. So a good example is uh, for, for my products is we have a slightly different profile than our competitors. So we have a, you know, our products when they're, when they're painted, you can see uh, aesthetically, you can see a difference, right? So it's one of those things. Some people like the way my stuff looks. Some people like the way, like the way their stuff looks after it's painted. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'll just work on those people that like the way my stuff looks. Not to say that I won't keep in contact with those people that don't think they like the way my stuff looks right now, because that's one thing about um, one part, big part of my process is follow-up even if those people sit on the back burner for six months and you just ping them every six months with an email or a phone call or 
a coffee, they always know that you're out there and that you're available and that you're willing to help them to you know, be successful in their business too. There's usually some sort of differentiator, even if it's, uh, even the low price guys has a mark, you typically will have a marketing department that has some sort of information on what differentiates your products from your competitors. So that's, that's what I look for. It certainly uh, makes a lot of sense to me where you may not know what that differentiator is up front or there may be some go-to ones you you try out but it sounds like when you're really with that builder or that homeowner whoever's the potential customer then based on what they're trying to do then you can find a differentiator that you can latch on to or really build that relationship and that I guess sales pipeline for that is that fair that's that's exactly it you you know people talk about finding pain points or whatever. I like to find, uh, positive points. I I'll go and ask, Hey, what, what are those guys doing? Uh, good for you? You know, what, what is, how did you make the decision to use their products? And that's, that's one of my favorite go-tos as far as if I'm going from, um, if I meet somebody in the grocery store, for example, and they're a builder that I've never done business with. And I find out they're using my competitor's products. I ask them why, I mean, why not ask why? You don't have anything to lose. They're not buying your stuff anyway. If they think you're the biggest jerk in the world, they're still not going to buy your stuff. So why not ask why? They'll give, you know, if we have a rapport going, they'll give an answer and, and it'll be an honest answer. Typically, I've found maybe your product doesn't fit into whatever they're doing. And if that's the case, wish them well and tell them that if there's anything you can help with, let you know, right? I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of things to sell. There's lots of of uh, spots to fit in. And there's just times when my product won't work for what that particular project is, or that particular builder wants to happen or, you know, whatever. And I'm okay walking away from that. I'm not going to try and fit my product into a, an application where it just, it, where it's going to have, you know, uh, where it doesn't fit. You know, if it doesn't fit right, then and that builder doesn't want to change to make it fit right, then it's okay. You know, there'll be something else down the road that I can sell them. Right. And what, what does make fiber cement such a great material for, for homeowners in terms of remodeling or building over other solutions? I am glad you asked. So, so the, uh, the, the main thing is, uh, at least in, in my market, the main thing that we've seen is fiber cement doesn't rot. And typically, especially along the I-5 corridor, you know, and I'm talking Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of wood siding that has been put um, on the wall the last, I don't know, 30 years or so because of um, problems with natural wood products that eventually they, they'll rot, they, they crack, they curl. There's lots of things why you would want to switch to uh, – a product like fiber cement. Fiber cement doesn't move, right? So think about your sidewalk. If your sidewalk moved around as much as, um, say, uh, or expand and contract, when I say move around, that's what I mean, expand and contract as much as, you know, something else that you would put on the sidewalk, right? So cement doesn't move. If it moves, it breaks. Yeah, the framing behind the siding will move and shift and and grow and and things like that. But the fiber cement itself doesn't move. So what happens is the finishes that you put on them paint, right? So typically product, our products are all painted. The paint that goes on your fiber cement will last longer because it doesn't move. Now it might fade from UV, but it won't, it won't peel like it does on wood. Your maintenance cycle is reduced along with your maintenance costs. So if you have wood siding, for example, you might need to uh, or wood siding and trim, um, that's where we, we see the most uh, opportunities in the trim area. You won't have to paint that trim as often because, I don't know, if you ever looked at a building that's been around for 10 years or so and the paint's peeling off the trim, it's probably wood. And that that's not an issue with fiber cement. The other thing with in the West especially, and that's and this is all over the West, is fire resistance. There are a boatload of um, 
wildland urban interface areas or wooey is what we call them out here wooey areas that uh that you just can't have flammable products on the outside of your building fiber cement uh doesn't burn so it's uh it's kind of a shoe in there well that that's uh certainly interesting so you, you mentioned that it doesn't rot it doesn't move and the fire resistance of what you do and i assume it lasts longer than the the wood competitors do yeah i mean it there's a million houses probably out here with uh with cedar on them and even now you can get good tight grain uh clear cedar products but they're expensive um far more expensive so i guess that's another advantage of fiber cement mm-hmm. wood typically they're far more expensive than a fiber cement product so it's one of those things where I'm not going to say that it's going to last longer than wood because there's, I'm sure if I do say something like that, then people stomp on the podcast saying, oh my gosh, that guy's crazy. <laughs> They're going to revolt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it is a very long lasting product. Okay. Um, I mean, you can look at the uh, the Coliseum in, in uh, what is it, in Greece, right? And it's concrete. So there you go. Good. Yeah. Well, no, thanks for being, uh, I guess, honest about the differences with the wood there. And, and it may not be, you know, certainly they may last the same length. And I know we're uh, getting close to our hour here and wanted to uh, certainly uh, thank you for your time, Dale. And uh, I really enjoyed the conversation, especially with the team development, the management styles, the, um, you know, how, how to uh, look for differentiators in a product is, uh, like yours. And I'm sure there's other uh, companies out there and listeners that have similar challenges. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to your company at Laura. And if, if people wanted to reach out, Dale, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Yeah, they can, uh, people can call me or email me. My email is D Cruz, K R U S E at elementia.com. And yeah, I'm I'm available pretty much all the time, and if, especially people in the West. If if I'm not the guy that is uh, covering your area, I can get you connected with. Actually, across the country, I'd, I'll get you connected with whoever you need to be connected with. All right, folks, that wraps us up for today's show. So you can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud by searching for the Concord Corner. And if you'd like to, we'd love a rating and a short review if you listen on Apple. Any feedback is appreciated on any of our shows that are coming out and or just the show in general, or if you just want to say hello. Uh, you can find out more about Concora and our services at www.concora.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash Concora LLC. We are on Twitter at Concora. And you can find us on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash company slash Concora. Thank you for listening and have a great day.